this is, this is, this is. And where are you at now? Are you in California? I am in Fremont, California, so Bay Area, um, down the street from the uh, Tesla factory. Nice. That's our, you know, new claim to fame. <laughs> so it's it's uh it's very uh very good for studio work because the cars are silent around you. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of creepy about Teslas. I love Teslas, by the way, but you know, uh, someday maybe I'll get one. I don't know, but uh, the silent thing, you know, just the fact that there's no yeah. noise. That's that's trippy. It's funny because like I have a hybrid. CRV, a Honda CRV, mm -hmm. and like what I learned about like that and the Tesla is that like they have to manufacture a sound that has to play at a basic decibel level in order to like be like like safe so that like people can at least hear some sort of car. So like I have this like manufactured like hum sound for my uh, car that like everyone's like, what is that sound? It's awesome. It's like yeah, yeah. That's like they manufactured it to be like a good, cool sound. It sounds like some like angelic choir. It's pretty bomb. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Um, there's all sorts of like, probably like psychological things that have to do with the engineering of these big, big things like cars, uh, the yeah. sounds, the smells even, you know, the, the new car smell, that's like a, yep. a thing that's kind of engineered into, into cars. I don't know if it always was, yeah. but it, it became a probably, thing. I mean, I would assume more so now, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's get to you, Sam. Yeah. Sam. Hey, by the way, what are those headphones? Those are huge, awesome headphones that you're wearing. I'm curious. These are Samson SR950s. They're really old. I've had these Got forever. Um, yeah, they look they look cool. Back in the day, back like I want to say early 2000s, I was sponsored by Samson. Um, okay. We because we used their wireless systems. They had great wireless Got systems, it. and so just kind of a, a perk of that was like all this other kind of random consumer audio gear um so yeah, yeah. <laughs> my studio is littered with with old uh, skeletons but still working that's funny yeah but in waco awesome. uh in waco i don't have you know my full array of of all my other stuff but got it anyway uh sam pura is it pura or is it yeah pura that pura? you said it perfectly okay um who is sam pura what are you what are you into what are you doing because uh, i know my audience may not have any idea but they definitely know some of the bands you've worked on for sure yeah so maybe we could start yeah. with that but uh wherever you want to go um who yeah know, okay so uh, by the way happy valentine's day <laughs> this is coming <laughs> okay got it so good i'm this like wait what it's valentine's day no it's coming out uh this is coming out february 14th on valentine's got day it. i didn't plan that just so happens that this is a Monday podcast, so every Monday okay, we release. Got it. But uh, yeah, what do you do? What do you do, Sam? Uh, so I am a studio owner, uh, engineer, mixer, producer, songwriter, audio guy, essentially. Uh, that's how I would like explain it to anyone who would be like, like to if any adult who would have no idea what I do and, or, or any relation to this. And like, uh, I like to always use movies as a good uh, analogy so it's like i like to be the executive director of films essentially when i make music so i like to think of my artists as like the screenwriters and actors and i'm like all right great you got a great story and you're like a great actor like let's make a really cool movie now so that's what i really uh try to do all day is like oversee the executive creative uh process of making songs into recorded material that brings joy to people's life ideally you know yeah absolutely how did you learn to that that to, to take it th with that approach you know yeah um i don't know i it's kind of i guess a little bit through like just the experience of making music all the time like i mean i started like playing guitars and bands and like recorded a couple albums myself and i was always more so like the the band like creative leader guy i was always just kind of like in charge of like doing everything musically and like sound wise and i was always like really obsessed with like guitar tones and like tuning my drummer's drum set and stuff like that so like naturally i just had this like curiosity about making records and like very early on got into like really loving uh the sounds of different records and 
and I, I had a you know seven disc CD changer, which is the uh, oh, yeah. thing that's apparently responsible for the loudness wars. Because a guy like me would go through track by track through different albums and be like, this one sounds louder and better than this one. So like very early on, like uh, listening to music, I, I would like was already gravitating towards like looking on the back of like albums and seeing who was the producer and like having the you know the correlation of like oh this guy jerry finn like is on all of my favorite records and like this guy tom lord algae like mixed all what is a mixer you know yeah. so like i just naturally went down the rabbit hole of like <clears throat> of just studying and like obsessing over production like uh how I mean, old, I, how like, old honest, were you when you started obsessing over these kinds of details uh, immediately, honestly, like once, once I really like started playing guitar and listening to records. So it was like probably like 12, 13 would be like the big like breakout era. Cause that's when I started playing music. Um, okay. but yeah, like I just, I, I was like already like reading magazines all the time, like guitar world and like just getting really into like gear and like sound and production and records and just like kind of like fanboying out over like linear notes, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. Like uh, today, I would like like call myself like an expert on like name an album. I could probably tell you who mixed, mastered it, and produced it. Like I'd like know everything about pretty much every record I've ever like checked out. I just like I won't even like check out a record unless I know who the production team is behind things. Like that's honestly how I find most of my music. Cause I'm like I like this producer's work. I like this mixer's work. Like I should check out this new record that they just did. And that's like how I've always found new material. You know. That's so. That's so interesting by the way that 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 technique and that approach to it um yeah can you name some of your favorites some of your favorite producers yeah like, i mean you found some of your favorite well, bands from i mean like you know first like first records that i like listen to were all jerry Finn records uh which then got me into like learning about ross robinson when like corn and limp biscuit was a thing and then okay. uh, from there like going into like okay well who's this guy like colin richardson who does like metal records or like andy sneep or and then like Adam D from Kill Switch Engage. And then you like you start learning about like the lower, like the guys who aren't like the big, big names, but like people like Machine at the time and like mm -hmm. um you know, then it's like Eric Valentine, who was like a local guy to me. Uh and then like just I, I really started like loving the producers who were like the engineers and mixers of their own records, as opposed to like the Rob Cavallo or the um, Rick Rubin or like the exe or like the Howard Benson's like right, the executive right. guys like were never the guys that I was into. I was in the, to the guys who were like doing the actual like engineering and mixing work. Yeah. Were you so you weren't as much into like, say, a band you were like where most kids get into like bands. I'm into this band. I'm into this. band. Yeah. You were into like, the producers and the, the absolutely. Yeah. That's like, crazy. Like when when the Slipknot album Iowa came out and like toxicity came out and it was like these are both like ross robinson records and andy wallace mixed both of these records like i was like into both of them because of the production team and i was like 16 and driving like driving my car like listening to those two albums like again six disc cd changer you know what i mean so it's like yeah. why does this slipknot record sound better than my atari's record or whatever you know like that's how i just like started really like obsessing over the production yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I, for for us, I can remember something you might appreciate. We were talking about going with a few different producers for the ever passing moment, and we ended up going with okay. Jerry Finn because yeah. he. We we were listening to some stuff he did, and "Head yeah. Trip in Every Key" by Super Drag sounds amazing. Okay. Uh, and then it just just it takes you on a journey. Like just it's yeah. it's a great record, but. That and Brian then, Gardner mixed that or mastered that record too, didn't he? Brian Gardner probably did, but I couldn't yeah. actually. I wouldn't bet on on that myself, but I believe you. Yeah, over me, I bet on it. Yeah, yeah. It's so good. If it's a Jerry Finn production, it's probably a Brian Gardner, Brian Gardner. one. I think I looked it up the other day. Brian yeah. Big Bass Gardner. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other record though that cemented it was Smoking Pope's um, Destination Failure. Got it. Just an amazing record and the sounds like the drum sounds it sounds like you're in the in the room with the band uh on both of yeah. those records and you know that to me is something that we noticed as bands we would notice production we would notice you know how how lively a band sounds yet good you know because yeah in, in the punk you know being in a, in a punk band we were always 
I, I heard our first record and thought it was good. Let's just put it that way. I wasn't always yeah, discerning, exactly. discerning the best the best possible yeah. sounds and mixes. You hear so. yourself through speakers, <laughs> and that's all you need to hear. You're like, it's amazing. I'm in a band. It's real. It's an actual thing, you know? Yeah, it took me a long time to appreciate it. But uh, <laughs> but back to you. Uh, I mean, I, I just want to know, like, what what else? Like, what what about sounds did it come easy was it hard did, did was it like something you were passionate about and then you you were you realized oh this is a lot harder than i thought it would be or was it the other way around where because you're passionate it just seems easy yeah i it's funny because like when i first so I, I when i graduated out of high school like i i had to find like a college to go to to make my parents happy so i found like a recording school to you know do my like bachelor's at and so i remember like buying like my first, you know, 002 rig and, uh, um, like doing a couple demos for my band out of my house. And like my band guys were just like, man, like this sounds so good. And I was like, ah, it, like, I don't know, like it sounds okay, but like, you know, we're just recording in a garage. Like I bet it could sound way better. And so then like, once I started recording at school, it was so odd because like, you know, we have like the Neve console and the SSL console and the tape machine and the blah, blah, blah. And like, so then, you know, uh, I'm like, working on like audio through the consoles and i'm just like i'm this doesn't sound as good as like what <laughs> like i get at home am i tripping and then i would take my stuff into the studio and listen to it and i'd have lab instructors be like like dude like what are you using to record this so like it kind of came like awkwardly naturally to me yeah. but i didn't like I, I thought there was like a better thing outside of me and then once i started touching that it was like actually like it actually sounds really good in my garage at home through my 002 rig so like i just like was very quick to like not believe the hype of the of the studio gear and like the whole like you know the uh pat like you know the pageantry of like you know making records and like studio gear and just being like wow i can actually like get really good sounds on my end and i just like started really committing to that and like recording all my friends local bands and like then local bands became bands from out of state and then bands from out of state became bands from out of the country. And then it was like, Oh, this is like what I do all the time now. So just kind of was like a natural process for me. When did you move from, from your garage to like the, a real studio space? So the first like real studio space, it was like a, a 10, like a, a 10 unit, like musicians, like only live work facility. So I had like one of the 10 units in there. It was like a 1200 square foot place with like, a tiny ass live room and like the tiniest like control room at least i had a window so i could see so that i'm like it's a studio room you know yeah and uh i did all my first like main records there and like built a drum riser and like experience like experimented with like how to get like bigger drum sounds and like just i did that for uh, like living in that place for like two and a half years making records every single day of my life like and uh then from there like started subleasing some existing studios. I was subleasing a place uh, in San Francisco that used to be Third Eye Blind Studio. And like, that was like really nice, uh, but like so fucking expensive. So eventually like I found the place that I'm at now, which is like, I've been here like 11 years. I can't even believe that. But um, it's like a 1500 square foot place. It's just a complete warehouse, had nothing in it. So I like begged my mom to like give me money so I could like hire some construction guy to like build my rooms for me. And so we did it and I've just been here ever since and like my landlord is super fucking cool and like she calls me her favorite tenant and so like we've been totally chill no issues here like I can make as much sound as I want like never had an issue um and like you know once I once I got this place I was like all right I want to experiment with like building a bigger drum sound because I was always like really like in love with uh Deftones White Pony especially that song Digital Bath it's like once you hear that snare tone you're like I need a big room in order for my snare to sound like that like I need like space, you know, so yeah, yeah. Uh, like I've always kind of been a little like a drum eccentric uh, in terms of like my production. And like I, I like I'm a firm believer that like if you don't have a good drum sound, you don't have a good sounding record. You know, it's like the frame of the house. You know? Right. Yeah. So that's where like I, I I've always been really obsessed with drum sounds and like tuning drums and like building the space to be like good for drums. So I just like I just went full full nerd. You know what I mean? Yeah. So is there an in, do you play drums? Uh, I don't actually. You don't? Do you play anything? Thing. Or So I play guitar and bass. Okay. Um, but, like, it's funny because, like, now I've been playing lots of drums on my records, like, the last two years. Uh, but <laughs> so it's, you like, do play drums. Like, <laughs> yeah, but it's, like, I, I'm kind of lying. I, I kind of cheat. I'll explain that in a second, though. But like, it's like I play uh, I mean, piano I, for me or something. Yeah, probably, like, your left hand and then right hand or whatever. Yeah, just... um, yeah so, like, 
uh, I have a good friend, Thomas Pridgen. He's like arguably like one of the like hottest drummers in the world. You know, every every drummer who loves drums will mention Thomas Pridgen as like one of their favorite drummers. You know, and uh, so like after like working with Thomas and like a bunch of like these really good like talented drummers, like it's kind of hard to have like normal Joe show up and like try to play drums on his records. Like, uh, you know, I know it could sound a little bit better if we hit it a little bit differently. Yeah. So like, I've always been really good at like tuning drums and like hitting a snare drum to sound and react like well in a room. So it's like, I'll tune up a drum set and then all of a sudden, like some guy will sit down at it and he'll play. And I'm just like, it doesn't sound good. Like, hang on. And then I'll sit back down. And I'm like, Jesus, that sounds so much better when I play. So now like, I'll just record kick by itself, snare by itself, then like overdub crashes and then toms and like I'll just play drums on like a lot of songs. Like it's much easier and like much cleaner and a lot better if I just like go and just do it real quick and split it out. So I've been playing a lot of drums recently. Wild. Yeah, the yeah. the sounds the sounds are weird like getting getting different room sounds like it's a yeah. never ending process. Yeah. Tone is in the hands, and especially like with drummers, it's like it's funny because like I, I worked on making a drum sample pack last year that I'm like trying to put into a plugin, and uh, like I so I spent like all I day thought, like thought you played drums. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, that, that's funny. No, no worries. Uh, so like we spent like a whole week, you know, doing that, and it's like I already had like my drum sound that I knew like was the go-to, but it was like a full week of like trying every single microphone and every single yeah. like preamp and EQ thing just to make sure that it was perfect, and so like. Once we got that done, like for the last like few records that I've done, it's like I just recall those exact settings and then set up the drum set. And it's like I just like press input on Pro Tools and it just sounds incredible. It's like this is amazing. And so sometimes like I've had a couple drummers like sit and like play through that setup. And it's like it does not sound good. Like did I plug something in wrong? And then I'll go and like record a passage of me playing. I'm just like, no, no, no. It's definitely the drummer. The drummer is just not sounding great. You know, so it's just uh, it like. Tone is very much in the hands, you know? Yeah. I'm, I assume you understand that, you know? Abs I mean, that's the same thing. When I play the drums versus Yuri, our, our drummer for MXPX, it's yeah. night and day. And, and yeah. you know, that goes with guitars as well and, and any instrument to a degree. Uh, there's a story yeah. about, um, I think it was uh, Aerosmith long ago okay. was recording up in, in somewhere, in, probably, probably in Boston, um, Baston, and... They were. They took a break to go to dinner, and they went into this bar, and there was a cover band playing like you know their style songs, and they probably played an Aerosmith song with it in there, and uh, they asked to go up and play, and the, the, it sounded like shit. Apparently, uh, got it. I'm hearing this like fifth hand. I'm, I'm sure, or more. Yeah. <laughs> but they go in there and they start playing, and and it sounds amazing. Like. It, they yeah. didn't even have to have good gear, a nice PA setup. It was just these guys are so seasoned and, and so good, you know. Yeah. But Aerosmith. Yeah, it's like the, yeah. the the classic, like, allegedly, you know, if you put Dave Grohl at a drum set, it sounds like Dave Grohl. It doesn't matter what kind of drum set it is. It just sounds like him, you know. And, like, mm -hmm. I've had multiple drummers that, like, come in and, like, they'll, like, they don't even understand that they're doing this. It's just a natural process. But, like, they'll hit the like they'll be like oh can i check out the kit and so like they'll like kind of tool around with like hitting like the kick and snare and like getting uh into like the feel of the drum sound and their velocity within just a few hits immediately changes to make sure that the drums resonate and sound really good in the room you know like that's how mm. you know it's a naturally like gifted good drummer who just like knows how to respond to the drums and so like they'll play different beats depending on like the decay length of the of the sound in the room, you know, and like what sounds good, like so. It's just uh, there's people who get it and there's people who don't get it, you know. And so like I I definitely get drums. I I can't physically play them, and also I respect drums and drummers enough to be like I am not a guy who can like play everything simultaneously. But I definitely know how to make a snare sound good and a kick sound good, and I could definitely play them separate from each other perfectly, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an art to that too, right? <laughs> yeah. By the way, when uh, when you mentioned your drummer earlier, uh, it's worth noting that he has probably the best ride sound I've ever heard of a drummer. Like his velocity and consistency with a ride is pretty incredible. Yeah, he's uh, you know he, he's an amazing drummer, super solid, and yeah, we we keep pushing him harder and harder, and he pushes himself, by the way. But uh, yeah. he's playing some. He, I'm like sitting here going, you know on the bass and he's like, yeah. 
that's what's crazy about drummers, right? Is just they're so yeah. physical, and uh, I, I don't know if I could do it. I mean, maybe I could do it if I started, you know, when I was alone. I, I could start now, but it's just yeah. a different a different thing altogether. It's like starting to run. You know, you're going to be a little yeah. sore at first, right? Yeah, I think it also like comes with the fact that like like vocalists like are this way too. Like, and you would understand that, but like your vocals, like that's like you as a human. It's not like some instrument you can like learn you know what i mean it's right. like you have to like it's yourself and like that's like a whole different like emotional like interaction and like like performance aspect and i think drums are very similar in that way that like drums are a physical like entity like being a drummer as opposed to like oh this drum is always going to sound good like it requires so much like dedication and like self-awareness like to actually be a phenomenal musician you know yeah you know, something I realized over the years as a singer in, in the studio, um, and hopefully this helps people that are maybe going into the studio soon, but you have to train your voice. Like, even if you've sang, you know, you know you can sing, you're great, whatever, but it depends, you know, the weather might be cold outside and you're just like, you know, yeah. your body's cold all the time and, and you're not singing a lot. Like, that's happened to me many, many times where I just went in kind of cold turkey without leading up to singing every day for like, I would say at yeah. least a week, something like that. Just sing every day, practice some songs, practice whatever, use your vo voice because going in cold turkey, even, even me, uh, I sing all the, you know, I, I've sang all the time in my life, uh, throughout my life. Yeah. But if I'm not singing, like when I get sick, something like that, you're not singing for a while and it takes, when you're not sick, you're not instantly back as far as like vocal yeah. range at least me i guess everybody's a little bit different there's there's miracle workers out there right but uh <laughs> but i think most people it just like you said it's the human body and yeah that's your instrument and for me i need to train it back i need to uh I, what i find is it's not that i can't sing something but i can't sing it as sustained i can't sing as high for as long as many hours as as really what's demanded in the studio. And, and that yeah. puts a big damper on everybody. You know, if you're, if you're scheduled to like get a, get a, a record finished and the singer can't do it, and I've been guilty of this, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> trying to slag anyone, but like, yeah, yeah. I, I think honestly training the vocal going into it has helped me immensely over the years. But anytime I haven't, um, Sometimes I'll just end up redoing vocals that I, we've spent hours. So I've spent hours of a producer's time of me singing, and then we go back and do it again. <laughs> and yeah. sometimes it's just, it takes what it takes. That's the process, right? So there's that yeah, totally. as well. But I, I want to get your thoughts on, on that stuff. Um, so I like vocals and drums are actually like probably my favorite things to record and like work with. Like I just love working on vocals. Um, and I would say, the two mistakes that are the most common things that I have to like teach and like kind of like have people have a light bulb moment about is like everyone and like you, you'll probably totally understand this. Every singer is really, really, really bad at committing to which note they're trying to hit because they're too afraid of being sharp and they're too afraid of being flat. So they always start flat and will do a drift up to the note as opposed to like starting on the note. It, they won't be like, and they'll go, and, and it's like, no, 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 stuff's not, it's with confidence, you know? And then if they overshoot it, they'll be like, and it's like, no, 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 hang on, hang on. Let's just breathe, like relax. Mm -hmm. So th there's like, there's either the too timid guy or the like person who's pushing and, and trying to do a little, like, it's like they're exaggerating emotion. So like with those people, I always have to tell them, I'm like, if it feels boring when you sing it, that means it's going to be perfect, like, because they're just always shoot, overshooting it all the time, you know? And then the other guys who are all timid, it's all about just like getting them to warm up and like be like, all right, here we go. Like now, like let's project. And it's like finding like the muscle memory of like every time that I want to hit this note, like it's like in this part of my stomach that I have to like flex and hit, you know? So mm -hmm. requires like, that's like the big self-awareness thing of a vocalist is like learning how to actually like fret your instrument. You know what I mean? Like how to be like, I want to sing this fret. So I have to hit this muscle right here, you know? Um, then the other like biggest mistake that singers have all the time too, is they're so focused on singing the right note and like on time that they actually have really bad endings. They don't know where to end correctly. And it's like mm. having to teach people how to just do that on the beat and be like, yo, when the snare hits, like cut out there, you're like holding it like 
one eighth note too long after the snare hit and like it's gonna like overlap between this vocal and so if you want it to sound like a smooth punch in you got to end right here as opposed to me like chopping that and stretching it you know so i like to really like push vocalists to like fit themselves into the nice grid that i want them to live in you know yeah yeah and so when you're getting their comps they're all similar rather than like all over the place it, yeah and on the same spot. exactly i'm with you yeah that's huge yeah uh i don't know how like are you back uh, max martin fan at all max martin oh, yeah i mean since you've been gone sure love it yeah yeah right <laughs> yeah technically dr luke and max for since you've been gone oh but, sure, uh, sure sure yeah the, <laughs> but both of them like are like the perfect examples of like like i mean max is like really you know the the older school with it um but it's just like you have to play the melody on the piano and like the syllable count needs to match up to that. And like, I just love like mathematically correct and lyrics and like vocal patterns. Like I just, I think they're perfect, you know, like, and, and like, that's where like all these people, they always try to like do too much drifting or they try to like, uh, just focus on the words as opposed to like the actual like melody and syllable counts. And it's like, this is like, so I have to like show people like lots of Katy Perry songs or like lots of really like, like even like simple things like it's twinkle twinkle little star as opposed to twinkle twinkle little star your name like, it's like <laughs> no 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 like like having to like really like break it down to like the basis of like melodies really simple performances and like really like like magical delivery as opposed to like trying to be dramatic and and diva ish you know what I mean yeah absolutely like uh hits like it's raining tacos right like it's simple <laughs> simple but very clever and very seems mathematical in the way he writes what's his yeah. name, what's name? I, uh i'm, I'm not sure know? actually oh stumped you it's raining yeah. tacos who's the producer who's the songwriter we can... i don't even know i actually don't even know what song you're talking about oh my god okay let me look it up real let's quick. look this one up my kids it's listen to it tacos. which is why i okay, know okay got it. um but it's Perry it's Grip. Perry Grip. Yes, that's it. Perry Interesting. Grip. Interesting. Yeah. No, he, I know nothing about this. Uh, legendary punk rocker Perry Grip. Yeah, he he has Got albums, just albums and albums of kids type songs. Just um, Got it. I don't know if I'm allowed. Probably not allowed to play that stuff on the podcast. Get <laughs> yeah, flagged. Right. But um, it's it's all very. It seems like it's it's like little cookie cutter songs but it, but the lyrics are super clever like yeah. um it's raining taco let, let me just look it up here <laughs> yeah you're gonna have, yeah, I you're, love gonna, that you're gonna love it you're gonna love this but uh i already started it's raining tacos from out of the sky tacos no need to ask why just open your mouth amazing and close your eyes it's raining tacos like it's just like that's, you hear that awesome. and you're just like Oh my God, <laughs> so good. <laughs> but That's yeah. great. Yeah, uh, yeah. By the way, side note, uh, a friend of mine showed me uh, that the Presidents of the United States guy is also like, he does like baby music too. Mm. I, I, I just had a six month old. So uh, he's like, dude, you got to listen to this Presidents of the United States like uh, baby guy. And Cas also that's Casper a baby nice pants. Washington. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I've exactly. seen yeah, him live. pretty good, man. Yeah. Oh, nice, dude. Yeah, what a, what a great group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... MX has played with presidents, but, uh, you know, and then years later I had a kid and went to our local yeah. mall and saw Chris Ballou is the <laughs> Casper guy. Baby Pants. Yeah. And, uh, Casper Baby Pants. He was amazing, like really great performer. That's awesome. Really suited for it. You know, he's just, he's the kind of guy, yeah. if you saw him on the Muppets, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. It would he's make total sense. Yeah. Talking to Kermit. Exactly. Or, That's yeah. what I saw. Like once I heard that, that it was him, I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Like he seems like he would go on Yo Gabba Gabba and write songs for that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah yeah absolutely and there's a lot of punk rockers like uh yeah. doing ch you know kids shows and kids music uh um, yeah i mean i'm sure we could k have a list of them but it, it's just yeah. kind of it's cool i mean I, I like to see that i like to see sort of i guess fellow statesmen associates what what do you call it you know like yeah. uh people that that came from the underground doing real impactful cool shit so yeah absolutely so you're, you haven't gotten burnt out doing rec, you know, just making records after records after records. The only thing that actually like really burnt me out was doing the label circuit records. Like 
basically doing a band. It's like, all right, now we got to like make this record so we can go do our headlining gig. So like we got to get in there and shit out a record in six weeks. And like, mm. so we show up mm. unprepared because like we've been on tour the whole time. And then like we're super burnout. So we actually don't want to like write and make the record in the time that we have. And then the record doesn't get done. And then somehow I get in trouble by the record label for not finishing the record, even though I'm not writing and playing on it. And if I were, I'd be everyone's worst enemy. You know what I mean? So it's like, I just got really like tired of like feeling so creatively like limited and like I, I eventually like posed like this that, that there's like three things that'll make me do a record and it's like either like it's financially good or it's like creatively good or it's like spiritually like fulfilling you know and so like I, I like at one point was like well this record isn't financially good it's not creatively good and like the entire <laughs> thing like is destroying my like spirit of my morale. So I started like really trying to like back off of like making those records and really just trying to make records that like actually moved me and made me feel like I was making really important stuff that I wanted to show people. You know what I mean? So like once like mm -hmm. once I switched that like mindset and went to like work trying to do that, things got like much better for me again and like I've I've never really felt burnt out ever since then. You know what I mean? Like, but that during the, that time I was like so burnt out, like working way too hard and like making way too little money for like products that I just was not even stoked on. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's good. You did a course correction, mid course correction. Um, yeah, yeah. What I mean, making records is is it's cool because it is the same kind of thing over and over, but it's also new people and it's new songs yeah. and it's you know, your old people coming back for new songs, you know? So it's like, that's, again, what I love about being an artist, but what I love about being a creative person as as my main source yeah. of, of income um, is just getting to do different things. You know, I get to make a record, I get to, you know, go play live shows, I get to go make videos and, and yeah. you know, it's just like, how do we, how do we make people stoked on what we're doing? You know, like that's, that's yeah. the idea is like, if we're stoked about this song in practice, then I'm hoping that, you know, that it translates also to the audience, but yeah, first exactly. and foremost, it starts I mean, with us. It, yeah. That's, that's how I always think about it too, is it's like, I mean, it goes back to like me being the kid in my car at 16, like stoked to like check out a new album from a new project, you know? And like, that's the shit that made me like excited about my life and my future and like want to like, you know, be who I am as a human. And so like when I make records and make music, like, I'm like thinking about myself at that time. Like, how do I make like the best thing that that kid's ever heard? You know what I mean? And so like, if I, if I today can make something that I'm really proud of after making records for like 20 years at this point, like, I bet it's going to be like pretty advanced and pretty good. You know what I mean? Like, and <laughs> yeah. so that's where like most of the time, like, like anything that I've like ever like really like felt like in my heart is actually like, like means something to me. And like, I'm really, really, really proud of it always ends up doing really well. Like, and it ends up like getting like a lot of good traction. You know what I mean? So like, and every record that I've like felt that way about, like has been successful and like more successful than I even imagined. So that's where like, I just really like shoot to make myself land on that sort of creative, like, and spiritual fulfillment at the end of the process, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you obviously have been, very highly sought after but what are some of the the big records that you've done i don't um, honestly i mean the know. I, I, <laughs> so yeah sorry. no no uh so like the the i mean the first thing that i ever did that was like that like put me on the map was there was a local band called heavy heavy low low and they were like a myspace like I've screamo band who yeah. like had yeah they had like some major like yeah, success immediately and that was like I made a five song demo for them in my garage. It got picked up and put out and then they started touring the world and like getting a good buzz. And then it was the classic thing. Like they got signed. So then their manager's like, I have a buddy who like produces records. So you're going to work with him on the next record. And so they do that. And then they're like, that was completely like not fun. Next time we're totally just going to make a record with Sam again. And so like mm -hmm. that, like kind of made me like, immediately have this like confidence that like oh like i'm already like doing tight shit and like uh, already seeing the magic trick of like once these bands get scooped up you know what i mean like they're all being taken advantage of somehow you know what i mean and like so it's <laughs> like 
the reason they're being signed is because the people liked the material that they made. So then they're like, you're going to change everything and work with a different creative team now. Yeah. It's like, that's that never works. You know what I mean? So uh, at least I like had that like insight early on. And so that's where like I really like found myself like building good relationships with people from the beginning. And so uh, Heavy was the first band that like really put me on the map. Then the second band would be the story so far. They were just a local band out here, like some high school pop punk kids that like they came to me and they were like, we want to make like a, like a serious like EP. And so it's like, okay, great. Like, and that's also like one of those really fun challenges where it's like, okay, like you want to make songs that compete with blink 182, new found glory, yellow card, like Jerry, like Jerry Finn, I'm coming for you. You know, Tom Lord algae, like you better watch out, you know? So like, that's like a lot of like me putting in all that, like research of like production and just like being like, great, I'm going to try to make a record that sounds better than those records. And like, that make like makes me, creatively fulfilled and then people are just like man this fucking new pop punk band the story so far their record is killing it you know so like then that like creates the buzz and all of a sudden i have more of those projects coming to me so uh i did like the state champs uh debut album uh then i did a, a record with this band called basement they're from uh, the uk i did their like first two albums and then they got signed to like warner and went on tour with weezer and the pixies and like that's another fun yeah. one where like basement comes in and it's like okay like so like I'm feeling like Pearl Jam, like Foo Fighters, like Jimmy World. They're like, yes, 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 exactly. Like make our records sound better than all those bands. It's like, okay, great. And then all of a sudden they're on tour with Weezer and the Pixies. You know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah. like, all right, tight. Like, so like I've always like really had this like fun of like building the thing from the start into a thing as opposed to like Metallica, come work with me. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to like go to the top and like convince some like big ego project to like take me on as their producer instead right. i'd rather like build something from nothing and have a band become a thing you know so uh right like then after that like i made uh, a record with the dangerous summer um i think you know aj love those um, guys yeah but yeah yep. like yeah so like that was like a fun so record too where it's actually like a little bit too from Warped yeah Tour. yeah yeah cool yeah Good so news. yeah like dangerous is fun in terms of like they're, you know, they kind of like reached the point where they're like, we've been on the same label the whole time. We've done everything they've ever said. Like nothing's ever really worked out. We just like want to make a really good like record. It's like, I, all I want to do is make a really good record. Yeah, like, yeah. I hate the whole label game too. Like, let's just make a good record. So, uh, like I'm really proud of the record we made. And like a lot of people like still hit me up about that record and like basically call it like one of the most like, you know, emotionally like fulfilling, like nostalgic, like dangerous summer records that these people have heard in a long time. It's just like, it hits people in the feels, you know? It's which, like, good, which, that's that's what that record was about. Which record? Uh, it's called Mother Nature. Oh, yeah, that, that's the one I started with, too. I'm a fan. Yeah, I mean, that's... It's great. Yeah. It's some of the... Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Way Down, or what was it called? Way Down? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, Way Down, yeah. Yeah, I was just fan... Yeah, that's a good song. Yeah, I was uh, gushing on AJ when, when he was on the podcast about that song, like, just like that. Hell yeah. Still, yeah, you're right, man. Good job. Good yeah, work. it's funny, because, like, you know, that that's like a song where, like, they write that song, and I'm just like you know what? This song reminds me of like Third Eye Blind in a good way. Let's like add a <laughs> snare hit in the beginning, then start that because I want to like, I want to beat this one Third Eye Blind song, which is that song, uh, uh, Good For You. And it's just like, ja, ba, ba, ba. I'm like, this, I, this song is kind of like that. Let's fucking make it like that Third Eye Blind song, you know? So it's like, I always like really having like, like an enemy to like fight and go to battle with in my mind. You know what I mean? It's like, Third Eye Blind, I'm going to destroy you. you know I, mean? like, I love like picking these, like, you know, like, have you ever watched uh, um, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan? The, uh, the documentary? I haven't watched the full thing, but I've watched a couple episodes. Yeah. 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 That's your mentality, I, I, Jordan. Like, that's Jordan? one of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, like when I watched that, I like really relate to Michael Jordan and the fact that like he's so competitive yeah. and like he has these like fake beefs that he creates in his head that like drives him to be the best in the world, you know? And so like, I, I'm one of those guys where like I want to be an amazing engineer and I want people to like hear my records and be like I was as a kid and be like who, like I like this record this record and this record what do they all have in common uh, this guy Sam Pira's name is on all three yeah. of them like what does he do you know like that's that's what I would like to accomplish you know what I mean okay okay so let me ask you how do you get better say you you're you got that inner dialogue I'm gonna be you know I'm gonna be third eye blind or whatever. How do you actually yeah. do that? Like, do you, if you don't know how to, I mean, obviously you kind of know how to do a lot of things just inherently from all your years, but, but is there some 
was something you actually do? Do you just do some research? Are you these days? Is it just YouTube? Do you look it up like I'm like me, looking things up on YouTube? Yeah, I mean, like, like <laughs> in the past, it would have been like you know, Gear Sluts, Sound on Sound, uh, yeah, yeah. Mix Magazine articles, like uh, anything that I could understand to like you know understand the signal process. Like, let's I'll give you a good example uh, of like something now. Like uh, recently, like. Um, I got really into like there was a record a couple years ago that came out. I, are you into that band, the 1975? I've heard a couple songs. I like it. Okay, so like but I, I guess I, not. I, <laughs> like one of my one of my favorite bands. Okay, like, okay. And so they had an album that was coming out, and I like couldn't wait for it. And uh, the week before their album came out, um, this pop star Charlie XCX's album "How I'm Feeling Right Now" came out, and uh, I listened to that record. And I'm I'm not even joking, man. Like when I was driving home one day after work. I was like having like a frustrating day, like working with like some guitar player in like some band. And I was like driving, listening to that record. And there was one song that came on that I swear to God, I pulled my car over and I was just like, what the fuck? This song is so fucking good. Like it just blew my mind. I had to like stop and listen to the song. And like that production, like it, it like changed my life. And it was just like, wow, like this is like one of the best sounding records I've ever heard. Like this is like, what are these sounds? What is like, what is going on inside of here? And so then that sends me down the rabbit hole of like, who's the producer on this? Like this guy, A.G. Cook, who is A.G. Cook? Like you YouTube about, videos, read everything about him. You're talking Sorry, about the Charlie talking. song? The Charlie? Yeah, yeah, X, the Charlie XEX album. XEX, yeah. Yeah, it's an album called How I'm Feeling Right Now. Um, so yeah, then I like, I look up, who's this guy, A.G. Cook, you know, and he's her like producer and songwriter on there. So then I, I find every article, like an interview with him, like listen to every single one of his albums, listen to every single album that he's ever produced, like study him. Okay. And then there's another guy on there who's named BJ Burden, and he's like another songwriter producer. It's like, who is BJ Burden? So I look him up and all of a sudden look up his old post that he would make on Gear Sluts asking about like Mars Volta drum tones and stuff. It's like, oh, cool. Like this is like okay. a normal like rock guy. But then he like goes on to work with Bon Iver and like, starts like making weird recorded like sample music that just like is like to me i'm like how do you even make music out of like these sounds like this is like the craziest shit so like i just i've been obsessed with like ag cook and bj burton uh, over the last few years and like just like any single article that i can get any sort of like sort of tidbit of like what software what gear like what is going on like i'm i'm like I just want to know all of that. Like, I'm just so obsessed with it. And so that's like, you know, like, like that dude, BJ Bird, it's like, all right, like he put out this new album from this, this dude, No Realm that I really like recently. So it's like, you listen to the album, you hear all these weird like sound clips. And it's like, I talked to one of his like assistants that I like met through Instagram. And it's like, yo, how do you get this weird tape machine? Like, sounding slowdown part and he's like oh that's because like bj bought a tape machine and like we were using that one day it's like oh cool like so i mean i like i find out anything i can like i'm obsessed yeah. you know yeah. and it's like 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 me telling you about this like makes me like realize like how like naturally obsessed i am like i'll just go out and find this information you know what i mean yeah. like regardless like i just have a natural curiosity for like what the fuck am i listening to what is happening what is the magic behind what is happening here like i'm obsessed you know i think that's rare and i think that's why you're successful is is Thanks, you know man. a lot of people that are curious as curious as you are are successful but um you know just that's it i mean i find i find that um a lot of people don't even know to just go ahead and look things up like it's just yeah they think they wonder something or maybe they don't wonder something, but, but, yeah. but like, how do we do this? How do I do this? And it's like, literally look it up. Just Google it. Like, yeah. Come on. Like, yeah. no one else like, knows. No search one else it into really YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And if they know. It's just like. Yeah. Yeah. You just need like one door to open you into the rabbit hole of just being lost inside of like endless possibilities of knowledge. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and that's where like, I just like. I stay up late reading, reading or like Wikipedia and Reddit like all night long. Like I'm just like, I'm constantly trying to find out cool shit. You know. Yeah, that's interesting because I that opened a little door into my memory and in my mind of when I started to learn how to engineer and record, and um, yeah. we have our own studio. But like, for a while there, I was doing the same things. I was on the forums. I was on all those like analog and studio. You know, studio. King, I can't remember the names of them all, but. Um, the uh mackie you know we had this mackie digital eight bus and it was like this new technology and and then we had the uh hdr the 24 
HDR recorder. And uh, so that was like what we had before Pro Tools or anything like that. And so I had to spend time looking at these message boards online because there was no knowledge anywhere. It was like I either had to call Mackie. I was on customer service. They did pretty good. But but that's basically kind of what it takes to get things done, you know, unless you're like, even if you are paying a lot of money to go to a school, they don't necessarily have all those answers. There's things that happen. No, totally. But um, totally. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. That, that's that's a cool, cool memory. But I mean, the fact that you're still doing that, <laughs> your momentum hasn't yeah. waned. That that's a testament too. That's amazing. Yeah. Mine's just my curiosity's yeah. just moved into. I mean, I still record stuff, but it's more just self interested because of my band and you know my, Got my music stuff. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's funny because, like, I mean, like, you know, I, I grew up obviously, like, playing guitar and, like, learning Blink and, like, MXPX songs and, like, shit like that. And, like, then eventually I heard uh, Bjork and Radiohead and Aphex Twin. It was just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, what is this <laughs> sound? Like, that's like, and so, and, you know, now, like, when I listen to those records, like, I know what everything is, but, like, at the time, it's just like, like, all I hear is, like, emotion coming out of the speaker and it like is like connecting with me and i feel something like what is this you know what i mean and then you go back to like listening to a punk record and it's like oh drums guitar bass cool i know exactly what this is you know like i i'm more interested in like the shit that's always like beyond me that is like avant-garde and like makes me be like what the fuck is this you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like i have no idea what i'm listening to but it's awesome you know like there's a there's a record that came out last year that that dude bj burden produced uh but it's a band called low and uh it's it was actually like my favorite album of the year last year um i forget the name of it but it's just l-o-w low look them up but they have a song like called i can't wait and it's just like modulated pulsing tone and like the most beautiful like acapella like vocal on it and it's just like what the fuck is this song this is crazy like yeah that's like like how do you make a song with no drums no synth and just like a pulsing like tone like this is crazy and this is awesome like wow like how avant-garde and advanced and like different how do i make music like that you know what i mean like so Mm -hmm. i just i'm obsessed with audio and i'm obsessed with music did you see that that beatles doc get back so i haven't watched the whole thing i've tried to watch it uh i don't know what about about it like hasn't like captivated me i'm like a big beatles fan too like Mm -hmm. i have like a big like beatles like deep dive in my life um and so like like watching it was just kind of like i don't know like i i could tell it's cool and i could tell that there's like some cool stuff to learn in it but i'm just like for one i'm not i think i consider that like the beatles lamest album (laughs) and it's like oh you're gonna give me like a three-part like documentary about that album like i'd rather like have seen a documentary about like abbey road like revolver or like sergeant peppers like this this album this let it be album this one sucks you know what i mean so but uh like it's it's cool to watch their interaction it's also cool to watch like glenn john's like not give a fuck about like mic placement or anything it's like jesus like they're so like punk in that way um, but yeah, like, uh, I, I still have not finished it or like even gotten it through like two hours of it. Yeah. I guess I just liked, I liked it from a, I am a huge Beatles fan as well. And I yeah. wasn't a big fan of their later stuff. Like I grew up listening to their like pop stuff, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Please, please me and, and, you know, yeah. Norwegian wood and, and, and rubber soul and all that, but hard days. You love the night. pre-acid stuff. I love the, uh, the post acid. Yeah. Stuff. And, and I liked Lucy in the sky <laughs> with diamonds and all that stuff too, yeah, but yeah. like get back. I knew the songs, but I never like listened yeah. back when I was a, a kid is what I'm saying. Yeah. So like kind of, it was new to me, even though I knew the songs, it was, there was a couple songs in there that I didn't know. So I was like, okay, this is, yeah. this is kind of fun, but it was the, the dynamic, I guess, watching the bands and how boring it can be. And I felt like it's kind of real, like it's fairly real. Yeah. And yeah, the, I mean, we have, there's plenty of boring times. Like there's people sleeping on the couch while somebody's upstairs, like bashing away on an electric guitar, you know, like uh, in the studio, that's a very real thing. So for me, I guess I just, yeah. I just liked that aspect of it. But, but yeah. uh, bringing no real pre- I didn't have any like any uh, thoughts on on Let It Be, you know, the album. Got it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I it's I I think it's funny how like again like people have this like romantic idea of like what recording a band is, you know. Like I yeah. I had I was doing drums with uh, that dude Thomas Pritchett like a few weeks ago for this mm-hmm. this 
record that I've been doing. So I had my neighbor who like lives across the street from me, like at my house, like he's like an older construction worker guy who loves Van Halen and like always tries to talk about music with me because he like knows I'm a music guy. And so I'm like, yo, you, you got to come out of the studio sometime and like just check it out. So like he came and like sat on the couch and like had a few beers and then eventually like we finished drums and Thomas takes off. And uh, then my neighbor guy was just like, yo, so like, I'm really confused. Like, you have to tell me like everything that's going on here. Like, what what are you doing? Like, I thought you record like bands for a living. I'm like, <laughs> nah, man. Like, like I produce records. Like, I film movies. You know what I mean? Like, we're filming scene by scene, actor by actor, as opposed to you set up in a ba- in a room. I put microphones on you and I record you. Like, I hate those records. You know what I mean? Like, that's not like a record to me. Like, I like making music and making productions you know and so like he had never like thought that that's how you can make a record you know what i mean like what do you mean the drummer plays by himself with no none of the band it's like yeah man like it's so foreign to like normal people you know what i mean like so it is i do think that that's the the cool thing about like get back is it's like cool to watch like those guys be in a room and like do it you know what i mean like make their songs and be tight also i think it's cool to like see john lennon because there's not really a lot of like you know, footage of him other than interview footage, but he's clearly like extremely funny and like also like not like a dick. He's like, he's like a really like funny, like sarcastic guy who like seems like he was a lot of fun to be around, you know? Yeah. I liked seeing, seeing John because you're, yeah. you know, everybody always says he's a dick, you know? And you're just like, yeah, exactly. I can tell exactly. He's just trying to have a good time and you know, it's, yeah, it's gotta be extremely awkward to be that famous. Right. Even, even back, no, totally. back then. Um, yeah, it's like the classic, new. like, yeah, Paul's the, the guy in the band that has like too much anxiety that he's like vocalizing at all times. It's like, relax dog. You know what I mean? And then like yeah. John Lennon's the guy who's like, whatever, like stress isn't even a thing to him. He just makes a joke about it. And then he's like done being stressed out about it. And then like George, uh, um, Harrison is like, obviously like such a deeply emotional person that it's like really challenging for him to like communicate uh, in an, an effectively kind way because clearly he's having the worst time of his life and he doesn't want to be a dick because he's not a dick. You know what I mean? But like, he's like, doesn't know how to like not be the sour guy. And then you got Ringo who like literally couldn't give two shits about anything. It's like the most emotionalist dude. Like there's no emotion in business. <laughs> there's no emotion in music. Like he's just there to like do whatever's there, you know? So it's cool to like see all their personality types kind of come through. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I think they did a good job before we go. I want to ask you about yeah. Brian Eno's oblique strategies. Yeah, what a, well, that's a unique question to ask me. How come you asked me that? Well, because I saw you you said you got a third set the other day. Uh, yeah, I have I have one set in every room because I have I have three control rooms here now. So I have one here, I have one uh, in the other room, and I have a third one for the other room here. And I also have a fourth one at my house, which I use for shit at my house all the time. Um, but yeah, like uh, big Brian Eno fan, uh, very big like Abbey Road like. Uh, fan and just like eventually learned about like Brian Eno and his whole like influence on the UK world and U2 and all that kind of shit. It's just like you have this like, like I, I fell down the Brian, you know, rabbit hole like mm-hmm. years, like a decade ago, you know? And so like, uh, once I learned about the oblique strategies, like I, I bought one and I was like, I, 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 I've been using them this entire time in my career, to be honest. Like, do you know anything about these cards? No, at all? Like, I just, ever, like, I, use these? I learned, I learned right, this so from like, you. So I wanted to ask and, and, yeah. and it's very intriguing so, to me, you know, and I don't, yeah. So basically like yeah. he, it's a deck of cards that mm-hmm. he created with this guy. I forget what his name is, Peter or something. Um, but basically there are a bunch of cards that just have completely like oblique, suggestions on there that Mm -hmm. force you to act intuitively so like let's say i'm working on a song right now and like we're having a question about like with the tempo is it too fast is it too slow like what do we think well i'll pull a card and the card here says uh only a part not the whole it's like okay well what part of the song is maybe the one that we should change the tempo of as opposed to the whole song like i wouldn't have thought of that but like it suggested that and like therefore like i'm using my own intuition on how to like read and respond to these cards. So um, I had a friend's That's band cool. who like, they made a record with uh, Chris Walla from Death Cab for Cutie. Uh, they were doing it in San Francisco and, and they walked into the studio and had no songs written and they wrote the entire record by making a song every day and using the cards. So it'd be <laughs> like, you know, all right, cool. Like we're gonna start today and like make a song, like pull a card. So it's like the card is, 
be extravagant. All right, play like the most extravagant drum beat that you could ever think of. And like, let's do some weird thing. That's tight. Okay, like, uh, what should we do next? Like, okay, it says remove ambiguities and convert to the specifics. Okay, well, like you keep improv on that one drum fill here. Like, let's like nail that down and make it like this. Okay, cool. Now that that's solved, like, what do we do next? Like, Okay, this card says, don't be afraid of things because they're easy to do. Yeah, let's go back to that easy riff that you said was like, like not that cool because we're trying to be extravagant and like let's throw that into this part like you can just you see where i'm going you know what i mean like there's no like creative block like you can immediately just like have a good time and stay inside of the intuitive moment as opposed to like feeling creatively like you know sheltered or whatever you know i I like how it allows you to you it gives you the idea so you start extravagant but then totally can ditch that and go simple for that part or whatever so it's just a matter of just getting through you know, from point A to point B, right? I love that. I'm yeah, gonna, totally. I'm gonna get some. I'm gonna get some. Yeah, you should, man. There's yeah. also they have an app. You can get it for your phone too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably yeah. more me. Okay. I like to have. So uh, as well. I think it's time for me to tell me, uh, for me to tell you my story about you guys. Okay. I think you'll like this. All right. So, I was 12 years old. Had it. I, I think I, I first started playing guitar when I was like 12. And I had this friend who played drums and we both went to school together. And he was like, dude, I play drums in this like youth group like band. You should come. Like we play every Wednesday. So I like went to the youth group, like we watch them play. And it was like, they're pretty cool. And like everyone like loved MXPX and had like MXPX shirts all the time. I'm like, who's this MXPX band? And they're like, oh, dude, like you got to get an MXPX. So I like eventually dove down the MXPX rabbit hole. When I got my first guitar, I put an NXPX sticker on it, and the first song that I ever learned, first like guitar lesson I ever had, I brought in a tape that I made of I'm Okay, You're Okay. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> teach me this on guitar. So that was literally the first song that I ever learned on guitar. And so after I like learned that, I was like, yo, you guys, like, I know how to play this NXPX song. Like, let me like start playing songs like in the youth group. So eventually it was like playing along with them. That's like how I actually like really started playing guitar. And then the first show I ever went to was uh, at the Fillmore, and it was you guys, the Ataris and Shades Apart, where like the, that Ataris album, Blue Skies, and then Eyewitness was the Shades Apart album. Both of those albums like were what they were touring off of. Fucking phenomenal albums, oh, yeah. like changed oh, yeah. my life. Like and so like that's where it's like, like the Ataris album. Who is this guy? Jason Livermore. Oh, Blast Team Room. You know, like learn about Blast Room. Who mixed this like uh, uh, Shades Apart album? Andy Wallace. Like learning all about like mixing Andy Wallace and shit. So, uh, yeah, MXPX is like the intro to like my rabbit hole of the music world. Wow. That's insane, dude. Amazing. That's a pretty wild, right? Thanks. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, man. Yeah. Very, yeah, exactly. Simple, but cool. One there. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm sure so many people screw that up. It's like, you know, it's just the right way to do it. (laughs) Yeah. How fun, man. Yeah. They, the Fillmore and also being like, 13 and just like that i remember like my dad was like this band was cool they they're kind of like green day it's like yeah dad like this is like this is punk music dad you know yeah so funny. yeah 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 green day was great i mean we saw them yeah early on too and they were always great so dude thank you okay so then i have Go ahead. Yeah. i have one other question for you all right <laughs> so because i've never i've never actually talked to anyone who's ever worked with him so i'm curious like what was your experience like and what would be your main takeaways from working with jerry finn um, Jerry Finn was so funny. He always had great stories, great storyteller. Yeah. Um, you know, he, you know, which that's, that's like such a sad thing about it. Cause like he didn't really do too many interviews. He was so busy at the time that like, he wasn't really like chalking up fucking sound on sound articles and stuff. Like there's not like much press out there with Jerry. You know what I mean? And like, he mm-hmm. like seems like everyone who talks about him is just like, Oh, nicest guy would love to talk and like share stories. It's like, that's so sad that like, we don't have any of those. You know what I mean? Like, cause he seems like such a great guy with like such a wealth of knowledge, you know? Yeah, Jerry was great. He was a drummer. Um, he would he would definitely like. We had this assistant up in Seattle. We we recorded at um, Robert Lang's up in Shoreline. Okay, yeah. And this was for the Ever Passing Moment, and we did drums. Okay. And he hired um, Sean O'Dwyer to engineer. So so he okay. you know I think for he started once he started mixing. You know he mixed that Green Day record, Dookie. And then that was just sort of yeah. like blew everything, you know, probably more than I do about his yeah, exactly. career. But, yeah. 
But they, uh, he was cleaning a toilet when he got the call for that. They were like, Jerry, you want to mix this <laughs> punk band from the Bay Area that Rob is calling about? Yeah, so good. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, so yeah, so we were recording up there, and, and like the, the assistant chip was kind of, uh, you know, he didn't know a lot, you know, and, and so they, he would, they would make fun of him and call him a mouth breather, things like that. Got it. Not to his face, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I got you. I'm <laughs> sorry. But, uh, you know, just like, just funny, funny, funny every, every day. Um, but as far as like the way he worked, you know, he was, we were ready for him because he was pretty easygoing. Like he knew, he knew exactly what he wanted to hear and he loved gear, just constant gear. Yeah. Like I'm going to try this out. I'm going to try this out. He would have, Oh, I got this new guitar. So it wasn't just recording gear and microphones. He would, he would get amps and, and, cabinets yeah. and guitars and basses he, he was just a freak he loved it yeah. um and it's funny because he was a drummer you know that's that's was his yeah. original thing it's funny i didn't know he was a drummer yeah he was a drummer the first to ever mention that yeah, yeah absolutely yeah so he started he went to college for like drum geek school i don't know what that's called but like somewhere in california yeah. and uh probably santa barbara or something like that and uh so anyway, he, he started out as a drummer. And you know what's funny about that is Steve Kravak, uh, who produced Life in General and slowly mm -hmm. going the way of the Buffalo for us, also a drummer. Yeah. Okay, got it. It's weird. It's just like, I think producers, drummers can be good producers because yeah. drums are the hardest thing to probably get, you know, so they can... They exactly. They it's the frame of the house. It. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, J Jerry, let's see, what else about Jerry? I mean, just so, so generous. He, he lived... Um, he lived right across the street from the, the, the House of Blues uh, Hollywood that doesn't exist oh, wow. anymore. He lived up, yeah. up across the street, up, up the hill. And so, like, anytime we were around, he'd, like, come up to the house, like, hang out, you know. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah, it was always the best. We'd go to dinner. So you don't always do, you know, we didn't always do that with all our producers. So he was probably the yeah, most, exactly. like, a friend kind of guy. Yeah. 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 The one that you'd bro down the most with. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, He's that's great. awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, what a what a tragic story. What a talented guy I'd gone to and soon. Yeah, so weird. Yeah, it makes sense that he's a drummer. I mean, it's like, duh. Like, <laughs> but it's and I always like assumed that he was a guitar player because like he owned so much fucking amps and like was like the guitar tone king. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I, I for some reason just didn't even assume that he was a drummer. So the story that Jerry told us about him getting that yeah. Dookie mixing job is yeah. there's a little more detail to that. They weren't happy with the mixes they had already gotten. And Got it. Jerry was actually the assistant on like one of their sessions. Okay. And he was just the assistant at, at the studio actually. Like he wasn't their assistant, yeah. he was just working for the studio. And so yeah, staff guy. they left and they were like, hey, can you just throw up this, this song and like throw up a rough mix for us and we'll come back uh. and listen. And he threw up, you know, whatever this first song was for on Dookie. And they come back and they're like, can you mix the rest of the record? He was probably in the toilet when they called wow. him. Wow. Can you mix the yeah, rest yeah, of the record? Yeah, yeah, got it. That's so funny. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah, so he got his lucky break. And you know, you know it's yeah, funny. Yeah, cool. The, a, a, a guy named, I can't remember his last name, Daryl, who was our assistant with Jerry. Uh, he was our studio assistant. He, didn't, he wasn't like hired by Jerry. He was just already always there. Yeah, yeah. He, another staff guy. Yeah, another staff guy. He was like the guy that would plug in all our stuff. Uh, he ended up being, he, he won like three or four Grammys for like mixing these oh, wow. like big, big records, like Mariah Carey type shit, you know? That's awesome. So yeah, it's just like, it's cool to see that. Like, oh, and it keeps going. And here you yeah, are. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I, I hope to keep uh, advancing and keep making better and better shit each day, you know? Yeah, I mean, of of what I've heard of your stuff, I'm gonna I'm gonna hear more, but it sounds amazing. You you really have yeah, a talent. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, good work, good work. I highly appreciate that. Yeah, this was fun. I appreciate you uh, letting me do this and yeah, chatting. Absolutely. All right, Sam Pura, everybody, follow him. Price at Sam Pura on Instagram. That's me. That's me. Cool, cool. You can hit me up and be best friends. I love to chat. All right, thanks for doing it. Absolutely, dude. Bye, y'all.